Welcome to Unbiased Science, where we bring scientific method to the madness. We're your hosts, Dr. Jessica Steyer. And Dr. Andrea Love. And we are, well, I don't know, excited and sad. I guess it's bittersweet to be recording the final episode of season two. Um, And we are wrapping up the season with the second part of our series on debunking period and period care myths. So before we dive in, let's recap last week's episode. Um, So last week's episode, just like this week's episode, was sponsored by Tampax and Always. More on that in just a second. And on last week's episode, we answered a bunch of questions that we received about periods and period products and debunked myths about tampons and pads. We kicked things off with a discussion of the menstrual cycle and variations in cycle length and flow across individuals. We took a trip down memory lane to discuss the history of period products and how they came to be. We spent some time talking about the safety and regulation of period products and how products have improved over time. That is an understatement. We talked about the stigma surrounding tampon use um, and the importance of openly discussing periods and period products. We spent a good amount of time talking about MTSS, which is menstrual toxic shock syndrome, what it is, rates of MTSS in the population, and risk of MTSS, which is extremely low. And finally, we spent some time addressing chemophobia surrounding uh, period products and set the stage for this episode, which will compare organic versus conventional tampons and much, much more. So let's just talk for a second about the fact that this uh, this episode and last episode was sponsored by P&G, Tampax, and Always Brands. Please rest assured, as always, Andrea and I did the the research ourselves. We put together the content for these episodes. Uh, We're very grateful that P&G recognized our efforts uh, as science communicators and chose to sponsor this episode, but the content is entirely our own. Andrea, should we just dig in? I know we have a lot of ground to cover. (laughs) All right. So I I think the number one question that, well, not the number one, I don't know, top three uh, questions that we received were about organic period products versus conventional. And this idea that organic products are somehow safer or better for us than conventional tampons. So let's just set the stage talking about what organic tampons are. Um, They're made from organic uh, cotton and generally processed using peroxides for purification, which are typically free. Oh, they are typically free from fragrance and they sometimes use cardboard applicators or applicators that contain plant-based materials and non-plastic alternatives. Now, conventional tampons are usually made from a blend of materials, including purified cotton and rayon fibers. Um, Rayon is a synthetic fiber that's derived from wood pulp, and it's known for its absorbent properties. Now, let's just cut to the chase here, and obviously we're going to get into the details, but there is no scientific evidence, there are no credible studies that show that organic products are better or safer in any way than conventional um, conventional products. You know, obviously, you know, we'll talk about some of the nuance, but but this all stems from misconceptions about what organic actually means. And, you know, we see that really often in the food industry, right, with produce products and, um, you know, shelf-stable products, even like cereals, where we see, you know, uh, organic verification and, you know, all this sort of stuff. And, and you know, ultimately, cotton is a plant, right? And so the same is going to be true for apples as is going to be true for cotton when we talk about organic farming. And and maybe I'll get into this after we talk about some of the the differences or the the facts about tampons specifically. Yeah, I think it would be helpful to have this, you know, the bigger conversation about organic cotton farming, right? And we we've touched on that in past episodes. Um, but anyway, let's just set the stage big picture is that there was this study uh, by Applied and Environmental Microbiology 
Microbiology. Well, it was published uh, in Applied in Environmental Microbiology. Um, it was a study of tampons and menstrual cups, and they compared MTSS risk, so menstrual toxic shock syndrome, for folks who use uh, organic uh, products versus conventional. And they found absolutely no difference in the growth of bacteria or risk of MTSS. And if you didn't listen to the last episode, uh, please go back and listen. We really spent a lot of time talking about MTSS and how it is, this is not caused by period products. I think there's this misconception that tampons cause MTSS. They do not. It's all about bacteria entering our bodies. You can get TSS from surgical wounds or cuts, lots of different ways. The risk is super low, and if you do get TSS, it's actually very treatable. So go back and listen to that episode if you haven't already. So I think the next, um, the next, you know, fact talks about uh, purification of the fiber. So you know, ultimately, cotton is cotton is cotton, right? It, it, the the farming practices, and, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, but ultimately, you're you know taking the plant, the cotton plant, and you're processing it into the fibers that are going to be used in the tampon, whether it's organic or whether it's conventional. Um, and and ultimately, um, all of these processes, these purification processes, use um, non elemental chlorine bleaching processes. And, and so ultimately, in the end, regardless of whether it was organic cotton or conventionally um, grown cotton, the, the cotton you get in the end, the cotton that's in the tampon is is pretty much one and the same. Um, you know, rayon is is um, processed from wood pulp, and, and that's a similar, you know, mechanism as well. We don't have issues with, with uh, trees that are organic versus non-organic, but um, anyway. So, so ultimately, you know, those fibers that you're getting are being processed using similar methodologies, and they're going to be one and the same once they're actually in a tampon product. The other, the other, the other fact I think that's super important is that you know, and I think we touched on this in some of our infographics and and throughout you know our podcast is is this concept of chemophobia, which certainly translates to menstrual products and and hygiene products in general, um, which of course is the abnormal or excessive fear of chemicals. Now remember, everything is chemicals. We talk about this all the time. It's the amount of a given chemical that actually can tell you about its safety, right? So. The, the identity of a chemical says nothing about its safety unless you're talking about your level of exposure to that. And so, you know, all of the data that we have, decades of data, regardless of whether we're talking about organic tampons or conventional tampons or, or pad products as well, um, demonstrate that the substances, the chemicals, the ingredients, everything we're exposed to in these products are safe for use, um, you know, at the exposures we have them. Now, there's a lot of marketing out there, right? So there's a lot of organic brands that are claiming that conventional tampons or non-organic tampons cause infertility, cause cancer, et cetera. But there's no data to support any of that. Um, ultimately, that's a fear-based marketing ploy, and we have a lot more to say about fear-based marketing um, in future posts on our social media page and maybe even in a podcast. But ultimately, there are no data to support that. As we mentioned, the fibers are one and the same once they're actually in the final tampon product. But maybe I can take a second to just talk about, you know, what is an organic cotton, right? And so organic farming have USDA-based guidelines, and really they relate to the types of pesticides that are allowed. And so again, a common misconception is that organic products do not use pesticides. And and that's actually a fallacy. Um, organic products do use pesticides and they are permitted to use pesticides. They're just different classes of pesticides. So they're termed organic pesticides, meaning they're derived from nature in contrast to conventional pesticides, which can be altered or adjusted in the lab. Now, those alterations actually can lead to increased stability of pesticides. It can actually lead to improved specificity, meaning those pesticides are only going to kill target insects or pests and they're not going to kill non-specific organisms that may be beneficial for the environment. Um, and we talk way more about this on our organic podcast episodes, but ultimately organic cotton and conventional cotton, they're both gonna use pesticides. They're different types of pesticides. They all have their different types of toxicity, um, but 
by the time you're getting that in a tampon product, um, they're obviously safe to use either way you choose. I think one other thing that's maybe important to note is in conventional crop raising or conventional agriculture, um, genetically engineered products are allowed. And we've talked about GMOs again. We have two podcast episodes on GMOs, and we've done a lot of podcasts on this. But there's one type of cotton that's really important to talk about, and this is called BT cotton. And this is actually a cotton that has been genetically engineered to have a bacterial gene from a bacterial species called Bacillus thuringiensis. And this bacteria produces these proteins. We call them cry proteins. And these cry proteins are produced by the cotton plant. And those proteins are actually toxic to the most um, devastating caterpillar pests of cotton. So tobacco budworm larvae and bullworm larvae. And so basically in conventional cotton raising, you can have this cotton species, this BT cotton, that's producing a natural insecticide by making these proteins, these cry proteins, and you can kill these really devastating pests of cotton without having to spray them with pesticides. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. Again, there's a lot of misconceptions about GMO crops and and Ultimately, there are decades of data to demonstrate that that these are safe and effective. Um, and BT cotton has been was approved in the by the FDA in in 1995, so it's been around for 27 years at this point. And and again, decades of data demonstrate that it is safe and effective. And maybe we can remind folks that tampons are class two medical devices that are. Uh, very rigorously studied and monitored um, and regulated by the FDA. So all tampons, organic, conventional, whatever they may be, they're all rigorously tested for safety. So, you know, if you want to use organic tampons, knock yourselves out. But, you know, they're they're not safer and they're, they're not better than conventional tampons. So, Andrea, another thing that I, that I think is, you know, you mentioned fear-based marketing. And I think that the the word dioxin is is thrown around a lot, and maybe you can talk a bit about yeah. what dio- dioxins are. But I, do, do you want to maybe kick things off, and then we can get into that discussion? Because I, I think that a lot of people will say, what will argue that you shouldn't be using tampons because of exposure to dioxins. So what what are dioxins? Yeah. So so dioxin are molecules that are byproducts of processing plant fibers, right? So so this molecule can be made by processing wood pulp into rayon, specifically after bleaching using elemental chlorine. So that's chlorine gas, or Cl2. That's the formula. Um, and, And ultimately, you know, a lot of this is kind of moot at this point, but I think it's important to remind people kind of where this came from. Um, but ultimately, in 1994, EPA released a report saying that dioxins, you know, could potentially be carcinogenic. They and in animals specifically, but they might also be carcinogenic in people. Um, they noted that individuals that were exposed to high levels of dioxin might be at increased risk of pelvic inflammatory diseases and fertility, um, and possibly complications to the immune function. And this is really what kicked off the misconceptions around tampon safety. But again, this was in 1994. Things have changed and all tampons, all fibers used in period products are not processed using elemental chlorine bleaching. So it's completely irrelevant to anything that you're going to encounter today as far as a period product goes. And specifically, tampon and always, um, you know, their cotton and rayon fibers specifically go through elemental chlorine free, free purification process. These processes do not produce dioxin and, and all tampon processes. And this is based on new FDA guidance. The processes to produce the cotton for tampons, there's no way for them to even create dioxins. So any levels of dioxin that might be identified in products by, you know, independent researchers or or researchers with with ulterior motives are basically what you're going to find pre-existing in the air and the soil and and, and everything you encounter. Um, Dioxins are also spontaneously produced by a lot of other processes in the world. And so there's really no way to avoid them. And again, I think it's important to remember that we talk about the dose makes the poison, right? So when we're talking talking about these carcinogenic potentials, we're talking about high levels, high exposure, chronic exposure, repeated exposure. And and ultimately, this is not playing a part in 
what you're going to be exposed to in period products. Right. Um, I, when you said 1994, by the way, my brain immediately went, oh, that was six years ago, right? <laughs> do, you, do you do that? <laughs> no, but it was a long time ago. And, and obviously, our period products have come a long way. And I just want to repeat what you just said, because it is so important, that Tampax and Always Cotton and Rayon Fibers, they go through an elemental chlorine-free purification process that does not produce dioxin. I feel like, again, you know, we said dioxin, chlorine is another uh, fear-based marketing word, right, that I hear all the time. So yeah, glad that we put that to bed. I think it's also important to remember that a lot of the data that have kind of played into this fear um, is based on Mm -hmm. animal studies. And we've talked about this a lot that, you know, animal studies don't necessarily mirror what's occurring in humans. So we need you know, clinical trial data or longitudinal data or, you know, all these other types of data. So, you know, there was a 2002 study in animals that found that monkeys exposed to dioxin developed endometriosis. And endometriosis is a condition where the lining of the uterine, the tissue that lines the uterus typically grows outside of it. And obviously, you know, this is this is a medical condition that occurs in humans as well. But again, this was not something caused by tampon use. This was something right. caused by intentional high exposure of dioxins. And again, as this process, this elemental chlorine gas bleaching, is not used to process fibers used in period products. It's essentially irrelevant nowadays. Mm -hmm. And and there's been so much research that has shown that tampons are not the problem, right? Exposure from a tampon is minuscule. And as you beautifully articulated, the dose makes the poison. To be exposed to such a a small level is, is... yeah, irrelevant. Um, and also, we forget, and uh, sorry if you just said this, um, dioxin is present in our food. So if you're f- eating food, you are exposed to d- dioxin. And actually, the World Health Organization, um, they've said that 90% of human exposure to dioxin is through our food, um, meat, fish, shellfish, dairy products. And again, just, I don't know, for the hundredth time, the FDA states that tampons produce today are free of elemental chlorine and do not produce dioxins. All right. Um, Anything else to say here, Andrea? Did you want to talk about any other chemicals that might be? Yeah, there's actually one other chemical. um, And and it's it's relevant to period products, but it's relevant to farming in general, and this is the chemical glyphosate. Um, and glyphosate has really gotten a bad reputation um, because of links to the company formerly known as Monsanto, and I'm not going to get into the politics of that um, or, you know, big agriculture today, but but ultimately it's it's – Its name has kind of gotten tarnished because of linkage to big agriculture corporations that have some suspect, you know, behaviors, not because of agriculture, but because of how the organization functions. But anyway, there are some cherry pick studies that, you know, want to suggest that um, this chemical glyphosate and one of the brand names is Roundup. And people have probably heard of that um, can be present in conventional tampons. And the reason that is, is because glyphosate is an herbicide. Basically, it's a chemical that we can use to strategically kill um, weeds and, and not kill our actual plant crops. And again, you know, the dose makes the poison, similar to dioxin. It's, it's you know, present in low levels because, again, it is, is used in the agricultural industry. And again, the dose makes the poison. So, so maybe let's talk a little bit about this. Um, so crops that are applied with glyphosate or Roundup are genetically engineered crops that are termed Roundup ready or Roundup tolerant. Because basically what these crops are, they've been genetically engineered to not be killed in the presence of this herbicide. So an herbicide is a chemical that kills plants instead of an insecticide, which is a chemical that kills insects. So basically what you can do is you can treat these Roundup tolerant or these glyphosate tolerant crops with lower levels of this herbicide and it will kill the weeds, but it will not kill the actual crop that you're growing. And so it's a very strategic herbicide that's used relatively widespread. Glyphosate itself is degraded in soil and water by soil microorganisms, and it is not leached into groundwater. This is a very, very common misconception. It does not persist in the environment. It does not lead to bioaccumulation. 
One other really important point, because people are always saying that glyphosate is so toxic and all this, glyphosate has lower acute toxicity than 94% of other herbicides used today, including organic herbicides. It also has lower chronic toxicity, which means constant or repetitive exposure, than 90% of those other herbicides. But on top of that, it's 94% and 90% of other household items, including things like table salt and vinegar, which means that you have to have a higher exposure of glyphosate than a similar or comparable level of table salt and vinegar, which are things that we generally view to be, you know, not an issue to be exposed to. So that tells you that it's an extremely safe herbicide. And ultimately, a lot of the bad press it's gotten has just been due to misappropriated public perception. Now, now, on top of that, tampon brands like Tampax have very high quality assurance standards for any sort of ingredient, such as a residual herbicide or a residual um, chemical from processing the fibers um, in terms of how much they can potentially be found. Um, and so you test to the part per million. So part per million is, you know, orders of magnitude lower than a percentage before it's going to be passed through quality control, before it's going to be passed through in terms of final products. Um, they also test finished products, so final tampons, to ensure that all of these traces and impurities and things like that are not detectable. Again, very, very, very low PPM range that you're going to be um, exposed to. So, you know, I think the big takeaway here is the dose of glyphosate or really any other product of processing cotton is going going to be so low, you're going to be getting more of it from food or from the environment. And again, that's not saying that that's harmful either. The dose makes the poison. Organic tampons aren't inherently safer because, you know, they are grown with other herbicides aside from, from glyphosate. And I think there's another important thing because glyphosate has gotten painted as being carcinogenic. And as I said, it has lower toxicity than 94 and 90 percent of other chemicals, both acute and chronic. Um, but there was a, a World Health Organization report called the International Agency for Research on Cancer. And this is an annual report that comes out. Um, and the 2015 report had a statement that said glyphosate is probably carcinogenic to humans. But people misinterpreted that to think of the levels that we're exposed to on a daily basis mean that it's carcinogenic. But the World Health Organization report is actually looking to identify hazards that might result in cancer, but don't actually consider the risk of our real world exposure to it. So basically they're asking, could glyphosate potentially cause cancer in humans under any circumstance? And so in that report, other carcinogens include red meat, late night work shifts, burning wood in your fireplace, and all sorts of other things that we know are not carcinogenic at the amount that we're actually exposed to. So to kind of wrap up this story, in 2016, the EPA evaluated the potential carcinogenic relationship of glyphosate at the levels we are exposed to and concluded that it is not likely to be carcinogenic to humans at doses relevant to human risk assessment. So basically what they're saying is the, the, the chemical itself and the likelihood of exposure in order to actually lead to possible cancer is not going to happen in humans. So basically there are no evidence of an association between glyphosate and various cancer outcomes, including a variety of different cancers. So again, my drop. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Keep it, keep it, I mean, yes, I feel very passionate about the, because, because I feel like it does a disservice to people who are trying to navigate the world of commercial products and they hear a lot of these buzzwords in the news and, and they're not appropriately explaining the true risk in terms of what we would encounter in our day-to-day -day lives. Well, and also I think folks don't understand the research process. You just said, you know, we're investigating these things as potential carcinogens and thank God staying up late or whatever you said, working late is not a carcinogen because you and I would be in very big trouble. Um. <laughs> well, you know, I think, you know, so, so this, this really, you know, brings me back to actually an undergrad course I took of cancer biology, of course, because I'm studying immunology. Um, um, and if you look at data, anything can be carcinogenic at a high enough dose. Even things, nutrients that we consider to be essential for life. If you are exposed to enough of it, too much of it, those things that we consider to be good for us 
can also lead to cancer. So again, you have to factor in what you're actually going to be exposed to either in a single dose or throughout the course of your life. And ultimately, a lot of this chemophobia just stems from fear-based marketing and a misunderstanding of you know how these ingredients play a role in, in everything, but specifically here in period products. Love it. Um, all right. Can we talk about period blood? Yes, please. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there's this idea that's really upsetting that period blood is dirty or gross or disgusting or unhygienic, and none of that is true. So let's first talk about what is period blood. So period blood is made up of blood, vaginal secretions, and the endometrial cells of the uterine wall that are being shed. So blood is is uh, a tissue, essentially. We, you know, it's liquid, but it is a tissue. So blood contains red blood cells. We call them erythrocytes. It contains immune cells. So your T cells, B cells, monocytes, dendritic cells, all sorts of other cell types in there. It includes platelets. It includes plasma. It includes proteins, including things called cytokines and chemokines, which are chemicals that allow all those cells to communicate with each other. So it's not just like a liquid that's devoid of any identity. It's filled with all sorts of things that you would see in any sort of organ in your body. I love that blood has an identity and it's, yeah, (laughs) it's true. Um, So if you've had your period, you know that um, sometimes you'll see clots come out, right? And clots are the body's way of responding to rapid flow and trying to slow down that process. Um, Usually clots are the size of a quarter or smaller um, and are no cause for concern. But if yours are larger, if you do have concern, obviously you should talk to your healthcare provider. Um, But blood that we menstruate is just, it's the same as the blood that comes from other parts of our body. It's just as clean as the blood that comes from other parts of our body, as long, of course, as as you don't have blood-borne diseases. But that Um, would be true from blood from your arm as well. Exactly, exactly. It's it's all the same, right? Um, Now, there's also this misconception of a strong odor during your period. Um, when you bleed elsewhere in your body, is there a smell? Yes. I know when, you know, like you, you have that metallic smell, right? When, when you blood, blood has a smell. Um, but you know, anyone who menstruates, we do, we have this natural, unique odor. Any excess odor during your period is likely just naturally occurring bacteria in your vagina, as well as copper in your blood. Um, and if you notice a strong odor, your your hygiene product has probably been sitting for too long. Any period product that you're using, right? It's probably been sitting for too long and you need to change it out. It needs to be replaced or emptied. And this is because, you know, when, when blood is exposed to heat and air, uh, the bacteria and thus odor occur, right? Because that's what happens when our blood is exposed to the air. That's just what's going to happen. There's going to be an odor. But of course, if you're worried about any excess odors, if things just don't seem right, or if they're different than, you know, if things smell different than they usually smell, then it's a good time again to talk to your healthcare provider. I, I have to talk about this this trend that I'm seeing on TikTok. I know, Andrea, you, you're not uh, on TikTok like I'm I am. I'm not a TikToker, no. I think, I don't know if it's called a vampire facial, if I'm getting that wrong, but people are taking their menstrual blood and they're rubbing it on their face. And there are these claims that it's, you know, that that it's, it's going to improve our skin or a glow. And, you know, even though the blood that we, we menstruate is totally natural and clean and all that good stuff, um, it's not a good idea to rub it on your face, right? Because some people are claiming that it contains stem cells. This is not true. And Andrea, I'm sure you want to say something about this, but only a fertilized egg, um, which is a fetus, (laughs) contains stem cells. So the blood that we menstruate does not contain stem cells, and it's not going to do anything magical for your skin. Um, There's this idea, and I know you want to talk about this, that menstrual blood is beneficial through the activity of our platelets. So could you talk to us a little bit about 
platelets and, yeah. and PRP so, and all that good so, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so there's a there's a lot of misconceptions that that are um, circulating about the beneficial activity of menstrual blood when applied to the skin. And and as I mentioned already, blood contains it's an organ. It contains a lot of things. It contains different cell types, red blood cells, white blood cells. Those are our immune cells, and it also includes platelets. And platelets are basically um, they were derived from cells once upon a time. They are not really cells, but they're structures or, or you know, small mi- micro cells, I guess, that basically help assist in clotting and wound healing processes. So if you cut yourself on your skin and you form a clot and you form a scab and things like that, platelets are involved in clotting. So if you have low platelet count, that means that you might be at risk for hemophilia or, or blood clotting disorders. There's also this notion that a substance called platelet-rich plasma, which is basically we take our blood, our whole blood that includes red cells and white cells and platelets and plasma, and we spin it down and we isolate the plasma, which is the yellow fluid in the blood. Um, So blood without red blood cells is yellow. Um, And it includes platelets. And they, they concentrate the amount of platelets. So then you've got this liquid, this fluid that has platelets, no red blood cells, probably has some white blood cells in there and then it's got lots of plasma. And there's, I don't know, an emerging group of people and clinical practitioners that believe that platelet-rich plasma participates or aids in healing of soft tissue injuries, things like cartilage or connective tissue, and and that it's very beneficial. And and I want to be clear, and and I don't want to get into the weeds here, but um, there's really not a body of evidence to demonstrate that PRP that you've probably heard of, platelet-rich plasma, is actually beneficial for these processes. Um, And that's usually done through injection, but we'll talk about that later. But ultimately, there's no evidence that this is going to help when applying it to your skin. But beyond that, we're not applying isolated platelet-rich plasma. We're applying, or people are talking about applying whole blood, and whole blood includes all those other things, red blood cells, immune cells, molecules, like I talked about, these proteins, these cytokines and chemokines, and and these things, and there's also other things, right? Cellular debris, dead endometrial cells, blood vessels, mucus, um, you know, and, and again, in and of themselves, they're not dirty, but they're inflammatory, right? You have these chemicals that your immune cells are, are producing to communicate communicate with each other and and lead to all these immune processes if you rub that on your face that could be irritating that could be all sorts of you know it could lead to all sorts of dermatological issues as well and depending on where you're taking this period blood from like if you're letting it sit in a menstrual cup for several hours or you're you're squeezing it out of a pad. I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my brain around what people are doing, but this is this is not sterile, right? Because now that's sitting in a in a reservoir, right? So there's sweat, there's potential bacteria that's from your skin and other sources that are naturally occurring, but you don't want to then rub it on another part of your body. Um, and again, there's other things, dead cells. And dead cells secrete lots of um, signal molecules, like danger molecules that, again, can be very irritating. So there's, again, first, no evidence that this is helpful to begin with, and this can be potentially dangerous. And of course, you know, when when I hear about this trend, I always hear, it's natural, it's totally natural, you know, this appeal to to nature fallacy. And it's like, yeah, poop is natural, too. I'm not rubbing that on my face, right? (laughs) Just so... All right, Andrea, we've talked a lot about tampons. I, I let's maybe we could talk about um, other period products. You know, the the whole <laughs> the, when we're talking about period products, you just have to select whatever works best for you. There are pros and cons to all options. It's a deeply personal decision. Um, I've tried a lot of different things. Tampons just happen to be my thing. Same. I know some people prefer menstrual cups or period undies or pads, whatever it is. So so maybe we could just talk about the different types of products and some of their pros and cons. Definitely. So pads, uh, pads, you know, a lot of people, when they first get their period, they, they'll they often um, start with pads. It's It could be a good option if you're getting to know your flow and your body, or if for whatever reason you're uncomfortable with a tampon or a menstrual cup. 
pads can be a great option. Uh, and you could use a pad by itself as a double layer of protection with a tampon or a cup uh, When if you if you sleep with those products. That's what I do. Um, if I sleep with a tampon overnight, I, you know, I'm, I don't know. I, I, I just like to have the, the pad uh, with the wings in place just, just in case. Um, or for super heavy days, you know, day one of my period is uh, like a, a waterfall. <laughs> Sometimes I'll, I'll put a pad on just for extra peace of mind. Um, and pads are available in both reusable and disposable versions, so you could use whatever fits your lifestyle best. Um, and pads, like always, offer numerous different types of pads, so you can adjust your size according to flow. You could choose ones with wings or without wings, whatever you like. So pads are great, but you know, there are certain things that you have to keep in mind when you wear them. So pads need to be changed when they're full, otherwise they'll leak, right? Um, pads typically last between four to six hours. Um, and, and some people like to change them more frequently. Uh, but again, that's sort of an average four to six hours. Now, Choosing a pad size is based on flow as well as underwear size. And if you have any questions about this, there's a really handy guide on the back of um, Always Packs to help you choose. And choosing the right size is going to lead to fewer leaks. So good idea to choose the size that um, that works best for, for you and your body. But you can't wear pads during certain activities like, like swimming. Um, or judo. And if you're involved in an... I, I, I was going to say, if you're involved in an activity, that requires you to move around a lot, like judo, which I will have, I have no clue. Um, you know, it's possible that the pad can move um, or shift from its original placement and end up out of place. Um, now, there are special pads for sleeping with special materials that wick away um, those gushes that we feel and larger backs for when you're tossing and turning, and they're less likely to leak. Uh, but some people find pads to be bulky and uncomfortable. I fit into that category. Same. I feel them, whereas I don't feel tampons at all. So it's just, it's not the right option for me. Um, but like I said, sometimes I'll wear it overnight or on super heavy days. Pads are a great option. So I had, um, I had colorectal surgery and, you know, things were kind of traumatized down there for a while. And so during that time, you know, it just wasn't comfortable to insert anything. And so in that instance, when I had my period um, during recovery, I ended up using pads during then. Well, and also after you have a baby, right? Because you can't insert any anything into your, into your vagina after you have a baby, um, vaginally. And so, you know, this goes for anything. This goes for intercourse. This goes for tampons. It goes for menstrual cups. It goes for anything. Suppositories. So yeah. A, all sorts of stuff. There you go. Exactly. So, um, so yeah, so that's another time when, when pads, uh, are a good way to go. All right. So let's talk tampons. Um, I, you know, I think a lot of preteens and teens will gravitate towards pads, but not realizing that you can absolutely use tampons, you know, no matter what age you are, right? I started with tampons first period in middle school because, you know, again, I had a conversation with my mom. She kind of walked me through how to insert it. I think that's the biggest like roadblock for, for younger girls is, you know, kind of not being understanding of their body and their anatomy fully and how the tampon actually gets inserted and where it sits and all that. But once you kind of get over that, then it's, you know, once you get the hang of it that first time, then it's pretty straightforward to insert. See, and I think that that's so amazing because I, like I said on the last episode, I was 14 when I got my first period and I was so shy about my body and I, and I wish that I felt more comfortable having these conversations because I was, I, I, I didn't know how to properly insert a tampon and it led to me putting it in halfway. It was hanging out of my body. And just looking back, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I wish I had these, these talks. So, and that's why we're doing this tampon. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so just like pads, tampons come in a variety of different sizes. Um, tampons like Tampax, uh, come in multiple different types and absorbency levels that you could choose from based on your flow. Day one for me, I'm super plus. Um, <laughs> I don't know about you, Andrea. Oh, yeah. Um, and then 
over the course of my period, you know, I usually will then switch to like super and then regular and it kind of tapers uh, over the course of my period. And there's this misconception that in order to use tampons, you have to be sexually active, but that's, of, you know, that, that, that's, that's not the case at all. Um, if you're old enough to get a period, you can use a tampon. End of story. Um, so if you're, like we just said, if you're a tampon user and you've recently given birth, uh, doctors recommend waiting six weeks before commencing use. And this goes, as we said, for anything, including penetrative sex, um, period cups, and you know, anything, anything that goes into the vagina. Um, if you're a judo, is it judaka, Andrea? Ju- did I say judoka. Right? Judaka. Oh, judoka. Oh my God. Sorry. You're cringing over there. I know it. If you're athletic, um, you know, if you're very physically active and you don't enjoy using like a bulky pad, just doesn't fit your lifestyle, tampons are a fantastic alternative. Um, and and you don't have to have that gush feeling. So some, some people don't like that feeling of actually feeling the blood, um, you know, come out and they want more of an invisible period. And so for folks, um, who, 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 um, don't want to feel that gush, tampons are a great option because you don't feel it once it's inserted. And if you're inserting them properly, and goodness, uh, 14-year-old Jessica, I wish you could hear this, tampons are so comfortable you don't feel them if they're actually inserted properly. You just can't feel it. And if you feel like you need to waddle, that's an indication that it's probably not far enough into your vagina. Um, You could participate in any activity. Well, yep, sorry. I was going to say one one (laughs) trick, because sometimes like especially when I have a heavy flow or if I've gone for a really long run when I've had my period, like sometimes it'll slide a little bit and then, and then you can kind of feel it. And, and just to be clear, you know, you can help it along if you need to, like if it shifts and it's, it's feeling uncomfortable, just make sure you wash your hands. You can insert your finger and kind of reposition it a little bit because there are tampons that come without applicators. And and in that instance, you are inserting it with your finger instead of with that helper cartridge. So tampons are great because you could basically do anything, right? You could go swimming. um, You could sleep in a tampon as long as you change it every eight hours. You know, your body, your vagina has no clue if it's daytime or nighttime. So you could sleep in a tampon. Um, They can be more compact than pads. It makes them easier to carry on the go. Um, And Tampax has some really great tips and videos on all things tampon. Uh, So if you want to head to their website and social channels, you could go check those out. All right, period panties. This is a, a, a hot trend now. Have you ever tried period undies, Andrea? I have not. Um, I'm not a pad fan in okay. general, so I just okay. I don't feel the desire to get on the period panty train. Okay. Well, so they're just undies that are absorbent, right? Super absorbent, and they're designed to absorb blood. And just as pads and, and tampons, they come in various absorbency. Some are designed to be used on heavy days. Some are designed to be used on light days. And they could also be used in conjunction um, with other period products. So some people will use period panties on day one of their period while they're also using tampons if they have a very heavy flow. Um, so the pro of period panties are that they can be more environmentally friendly, um, they're comfortable, and they're typically a one-time investment, so they're good on your wallet. Um, the cons are that the startup cost is higher. Um, you have to invest in multiple pairs uh, of the undies to prepare um, unless you're doing laundry on a daily basis, right? You have to come prepared with multiple pairs. Um, and, and for me and other people I've heard, you can feel more wetness than with a tampon, right? Cause you're, 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 you're sitting in your period underwear, which fills with blood. Um, even though it's absorbent, you can kind of feel that wetness and dampness. Um, and it's also an issue for folks who don't have access um, to, you know, easy access to, to washing machines or to water to wash the reusable underwear properly. I was, you, you just read my mind. I think that a lot of you know, the environmental impact of reusable options is obviously something to consider, but we have to also remember that 
those need to be sanitized properly. And there are a lot of people, whether it be, you know, in in developing countries, those experiencing homelessness, whatever the case happens to be, that don't have the resources to thoroughly sanitize these types of products. And then if you're reusing them, that could be that could be dangerous without properly cleaning them, right? Because you could be introducing harmful bacteria into your body. Um, if you're interested, always Z's period underwear. Um, oh, well, excuse me. Always offers um, always Z's period underwear, and that's a disposable option. Actually, if you're interested in the 360 protection, period underwear can provide, but don't want to or have access to wash reusable underwear properly. So hot tip. All right. Now, I feel like menstrual cups, we have to talk menstrual cups, they're all the rage right now, so let's talk about what they are. It's um, Menstrual cups are ins inserted into the vagina, and they collect blood into the cup, which can then be emptied and then washed, wiped, or rinsed, uh, depending on the scenario that you find yourself in, and then reinserted. Um, so you basically, you you fold them up, and then you you put them, you insert them into your vagina. Um, they're they're all often made of silicone, but they can also be made of rubber or thermoplastics. And depending on the size of the cup, they can hold one to two ounces of blood, which is the equivalent of three to six tampons. So a lot of people really like menstrual cups because they are environmentally friendly, right? You can reuse them um, when inserted properly. They're quite comfortable, uh, money saving. So just like period underwear, they're typically a one-time investment. Um, they could be left in for a longer period of time. Ha, no pun intended. Uh, longer, longer than a tampon. So you could actually leave a menstrual cup in for about 12 hours. And then just as with a tampon, you could uh, go about your life, engage in physical activities, or swimming, whatever you want with a menstrual cup inserted. Now, the cons of menstrual cups, why they're not a fit for everyone, is that it can take some time to find the right fit and you have to sometimes go through a couple of different cups to figure out what works best for your body. Um, most companies do have size guides to help you out and, and, and figure out what should work for your body, but it could be kind of like a trial and error uh, situation. Uh, it can also take a few tries to get insertion and uh, to, to get, you know, to, to get it properly inserted. And I've tried a menstrual cup and I think they're cool. I think it's a good option, um, but I definitely did. It took me a little bit to figure figure out how to properly insert. You have to, you know, kind of get up there a little bit. Um, but once you get the hang of it, it can be a great option. Um, it can be a little bit messy, uh, you know, especially in the beginning when you're figuring out to, to remove it. Um, and if you have an IUD, it's definitely a good idea to talk to your doctor first before you, um, before you choose a menstrual cup. I want to echo the issue with period underwear here. Again, menstrual cups are not necessarily a viable option for people that don't have the ability, access to clean and potable water, the ability to properly clean them and sanitize them. Um, so, you know, yes, there is an environmental benefit. And, and once you kind of figure out what your size is and how to fit them and get that kind of seal um, when you insert them, um, you know, there's an economic advantage as well. Um, but again, they're not necessarily an option for everyone. Right. So again, as we've said, you just have to um, figure out what works best for you. There's no best period product. Each of them comes with their own pros and cons. So figure out what works best for your body. Now, we do often hear about the environmental impact of things like, um, you know, tampon applicators. So let, let's talk about this because this is a genuine concern. So Andrea, could you uh, take us through this discussion? Yeah. So, I mean, just like any disposable product, there's going to be potential environmental impact, right? We're making waste, um, both using the product and disposing of it, and also in the processing of the products in the first place. So that's true for the manufacturing of menstrual cups and period underwear, as it's true for any clothing we use or, you know, food products or cooking implements. Um, so certainly, you know, we want to try and minimize our impact on the environment, but of course we have to consider our individual contributions in terms of, you know, contributions at large. But certainly plastics in particular, 
de- decompose very, very slowly. And so, you know, there are there are legitimate concerns that, you know, particularly applicators of period products that contain plastic, they're going to decompose relatively slowly compared to other items. And so a lot of companies are moving towards um, making products that minimize this sort of waste. And so there are tampons that exist without applicators, as I mentioned, and this is actually very common in Europe. Um, and there's also tampon products that have cardboard applicators that are going to de- decompose more quickly and are a little more environmentally friendly than plastics. Um, you know, as we talked about a little bit, reusable products, you know, they create less waste on a per period basis. Um, but, you know, of course, we also have to consider the environmental impact of the manufacturing of those products, right? Silicones and thermoplastics, they're still ultimately plastics, right? Um, and again, as we mentioned, they're not always practical. You need to have access to clean water, potable water, ways to sanitize them. And I think people also forget that water consumption, you know, excess water consumption can also l- contribute to environmental impact. Um, and, and something, of course, that we want to consider for those who are using reusable period products is they do need to be cleaned and stored properly because that can ultimately play a risk of uh, bacterial infection to you the next time you use them. So if you are going the reusable route for you know, reduced environmental impact, we do want to ensure that you are cleaning and storing them safely for your own health. So some people who are tampon users and have this concern, as you said, they could use the applicator-free version. And actually, that's super common uh, outside of the U.S. I have a, a, a friend from Australia. She needed a tampon, and so she asked me for one, and she looked at, looked at mine, and she said, what is this? I have no idea how to use this applicator. So she actually pushed it through and just used the actual you know, tampon itself. So I thought that was really funny. But um, yeah, I think you raised some really important uh, considerations. And I think that people just automatically think that, you know, the plastic applicators, that's the only way that we're impacting the environment. But there are lots of other ways that we impact the environment. So thank you for, for highlighting those. I think, you know, the big takeaway is there's no perfect solution, right? Everybody that has a period has to find something that works best for their lifestyle, that makes them comfortable, you know, and we have to weigh, you know, the impacts and the trade-offs and there isn't a right or wrong answer. And that's why there are so many period products out there. All right. Well, we we really hope that you enjoyed this episode in this series. And I I just want to thank you all for tuning in and for all of your support. Um, Fear not, we will be back um, better than ever for season three of the pod. Uh, With that, Andrea, can you take us home? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining us today. We hope you learned a thing or two. And if you like our pod, please share with your friends and family and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And remember, folks, if you want more unbiased science, please check out our Substack subscription. We post extended content on there that is not available on our social media channels. And we regularly respond to questions and comments from subscribers. So you'll have a direct line to me and Jess. In addition, subscribing to our Substack also gives you access to our private Facebook group, our monthly live Q&As, and other perks from the pod. So check it out at theunbiasedscipod.substack.com. So thanks, everyone. This wraps up season two of the pod. We are so grateful for your support and for tuning in. We're taking a little summer break to reset and plan to come back stronger for season three, um, probably around the September timeline. We will, of course, continue to provide updates on COVID-19 and many other science and public health topics on our social media accounts. So be sure to follow us on Instagram Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Unbiased SciPod. Catch you next time on the pod, your trusted source for no nonsense, just science. Yeah, oh, I am a scientist. Yeah, oh, I am a scientist.